All right, one of the things we want to talk about this week is basic rational functions. Uh, well, in general, we're going to talk about rational functions, uh, what the heck these things even mean, and not only how we can graph them, but certain features of rational functions, uh, which you'll either recall or learn the uh, asymptotes this week. And uh, we'll talk about the vertical and horizontal asymptotes. So let's go through a couple um, basic rational functions along with uh, what these things are. So a rational function in uh, math lingo takes the form of this p of x over q of x, all right? And p and q are just polynomial functions. So after last week, you guys should know right off the top of your head what I mean by polynomial functions. And because we have this q of x, or a polynomial function in the denominator, we certainly have to add that condition that q of x cannot equal zero. Okay, so obviously we're going to get some uh, restricted domains with these functions. Uh, this often comes up when you guys have had to set the denominator equal to zero to find undefined um, x values. All right, but the way I will tell students to think of the word rational in math is that it means fraction. All right, so unlike psychology where maybe it relates to sanity, uh, which probably um, all of you have lost by this point in the semester, uh, here, a rational function simply means a fraction of polynomial functions. All right, examples of rational functions. So here, f of x equals 1 over x is our most basic uh, rational function. You'll hear me refer to it as the reciprocal function because uh, x is in the denominator. It is a reciprocal of just plain old y equals x. Okay, here in this function where we have x plus 1 divided by 3x squared minus 4x plus 2, you can see we have a fraction of polynomials. In the numerator, we have a line, x plus 1, and in the denominator, we have a quadratic function. And together, uh, this makes a rational function. All right, and here's another example, f of x equals 2x squared minus 5x minus 6 all divided by x squared plus 6x plus 12. All right, what we have here is a quadratic function in the numerator and a quadratic function in the denominator. Thus, we have a fraction of polynomials. All right, so again, there's three simple examples of what rational functions look like. All right, and this is important, guys. The graph will usually have at least one discontinuity since the denominator cannot equal zero. We can have more than one, uh, and we can have none, but usually we're going to have at least one. Okay, so let's talk about this basic reciprocal function 1 over x. All right, and here's just a, a domain range table where I'm plugging in values. So on the left side, you see my x column, and maybe I plug in negative 2, and I get a y value of negative 1 half. All right, and you can follow down where, okay, I plug in negative 1, I get negative 1, I plug in negative 1 half, so let me grab my pen on this one and show you what that looks like, because maybe some of you don't see how that becomes negative 2. So if I plug in negative 1 half, what I'm getting is my numerator 1 divided by what I'm plugging in, which is negative 1 half. All right, and how do we divide by a fraction? And hopefully you guys remember, well, we don't, Angie. We multiply by the reciprocal. And that's exactly what we do. So we take 1 and multiply it by the reciprocal of negative 1 half, which is negative 2. And that is how I'm getting this negative 2 here. All right, and I go to plug in 0, and oh, shoot, I can't. All right, the mathematical world as we know it blows up. All right, otherwise known as undefined. So here I can't plug in zero, and then I can continue to plug in some positive values. All right, and why is it called the reciprocal function? Again, just note that the y values are reciprocals of the x values. So whatever I plug in for x, the reciprocal is going to be my range value. All right, and here is a perfect example of what the reciprocal function looks like. Okay, so we can see it has these two pieces. There's a piece in the first quadrant, and then there's a piece uh, in the third quadrant. So let's talk about some of the characteristics of this graph. 
All right, the domain. What part of the x-axis are we using? All right, and I'm going to say it another way. What can we not plug in? And hopefully from the previous slide, you remember, hey, we can't plug in zero. We got something undefined. And that's what we see here in the domain of negative infinity to zero, union zero to infinity. That's the exact same thing as x not equal to zero, all right, which you know because we can't divide by zero, all right? Now for the range, similarly, and right now we're just going to look at the graph and accept this range as fact, and that is that you can see um, as x goes to positive and negative infinity, all right, so as we look out here and, and look over here on the negative side, we can see that our graph is approaching either the bottom or the top of the x-axis. Does it ever touch the x-axis? No. All right, and so the x-axis is, is a synonym for y equals zero. And so here in the range, y cannot equal zero. And so I'm going to add the, the easier notation here of y cannot equal zero. All right. So how else can we interpret this domain, all right, is in saying that x cannot equal zero, we can say, hey, we are discontinuous at x equals zero, okay? And here I'm going to introduce um, what I mean by discontinuous at x equals zero, and, and we see, all right, here is x equals zero, the y-axis. We're discontinuous. We're as, as x is getting closer and closer to zero, all right, our function is either going to negative infinity or positive infinity. And we will refer to when this happens at, as a vertical asymptote. And so here our y-axis is a vertical asymptote. Okay, so again, for right now, accept it as fact, and I'll be explaining it a whole lot more in the next lecture. And we will also be referring to the x-axis here as a horizontal asymptote, meaning our function is going to get infinitely close, but it is never going to touch the x-axis. Okay, so when we have these vertical and horizontal lines that our function can never ever touch, then we're going to refer to them as asymptotes. All right, and then notice this is an odd function. All right, so the reciprocal function has symmetry to the origin. And hopefully you can see that, again, let me grab my pen, if we were to flip this first quadrant piece over the y-axis, we'd have, well, minus my horrible graph, we'd have something that looks like this. And then we could flip it over the x-axis and get what we have here in our third quadrant. All right, so again, we do have odd symmetry, okay, um, so we are symmetric to the origin. All right, so let's talk about how we can use this reciprocal function with translations. All right, so here we have f of x equals 1 over x plus 1 and then all minus 2. All right, so you need to know what does 1 over x look like. In fact, when I say 1 over x, it needs to be like x squared, x cubed, absolute value x, just one of those basic functions that pops into your mind. Okay, now what does, and we can all read this, and you can certainly read it on your own time, but I'm going to break it down. What does this plus 1 do when we add 1 simply to the x? Notice I'm not adding it to the whole function. I'm only adding 1 to the x. And here, this is going to be a horizontal shift, and we are going to the left, because it's opposite sign, 1 unit. Okay, and here, what does this minus 2 on the outside do? All right. That is a vertical shift, and it's going to send our reciprocal function down to. Okay, and so let's take a look here at this graph and see if that makes sense to us. Okay, and again, it's, it's a huge benefit to you guys that you're actually listening to this because it's so easy to let your eyes get lost in a reciprocal function or a rational function. All right, what we're, when I say, hey, we're going to the left one and we're going down two, I'm referring to how those asymptotes are moving, okay? And so we can see that the asymptotes have moved left one 
and down two because in the plain old reciprocal function, the basic function, our asymptotes are the axes. Okay, and so here our x-axis asymptote or the horizontal asymptote has moved down two and the vertical asymptote or the y-axis has moved to the left one. And then we just have our reciprocal function in what is now the shifted first quadrant and the shifted third quadrant. All right, and now pay attention to how that changes our domain and range. Before, x could not equal zero and y could not equal zero. But since our asymptotes have moved, now our domain excludes negative one. So in other words, since we go to the left one, x cannot equal negative one. Similarly, since we shifted down two, y can now not equal negative two. All right, let's talk about one more basic rational function, all right, and that is one over x squared. All right, and so let's just go through another uh, domain range table here. All right, and we're gonna plug in different numbers. If I plug in negative two, all right, so I plug in negative two, and I get one fourth. Notice also that if I plug in two, what am I getting? I'm also getting one fourth. Okay, and in the same way, as I showed you on the previous slide with one over x, dividing by a fraction just means multiplying by the reciprocal, and so we get a range value of four. All right, so in other words, notice that whatever we plug in for x, the y values are squared reciprocals of the x values. All right, and here is the graph of what one over x squared looks like. All right, hope in an ideal world, maybe you can already start to see the horizontal asymptote, the vertical asymptote, some symmetry. All right, so let's first talk about the domain. What can x not equal? Well, guys, we still can't divide by zero. So again, x cannot equal zero, which we see in our domain interval notation. All right, what about the range? Well, when I look at the range, what I'm noticing, and some of you know I've, this is the way I've talked to you when I've worked with you one-on-one, -on -one, is that our y values are being used here in the first and second quadrant. All right, and let me say it another way. Our function sits entirely in the first quadrant and the sec second quadrant, meaning our function sits above the x-axis. And so our range is going to be the positive end of the y-axis, or zero to infinity. All right, again, we can see we are discontinuous at x equals zero, all right, meaning our y-axis is indeed a vertical asymptote. Our function is getting closer and closer to the y-axis, and it, but it's never gonna touch it because we can't divide by zero. All right, similarly, the x-axis is a horizontal asymptote. Even though it looks like we may be touching the x-axis down here, we're not. We're getting infinitely close. All right, so, I mean, and if, and if you don't see it, think about, let's plug in 100. Then we're getting 1 over 100 squared. That's very, 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 very close to zero, is it not? Sure it is. And so, again, we're constantly getting closer and closer to zero or the x-axis, but we'll never actually get there. All right, and hopefully you see that this is an even function, aside from x being squared. Uh, it is even. We can see that it has y-axis symmetry. All right, and we are increasing in the second quadrant, so we're increasing uh, from negative infinity to zero. We can follow, again, when we're reading left to right, we follow our function, and clearly we are increasing here. And then once we cross over the y-axis, in the first quadrant, we can see that our function is decreasing on zero to infinity. All right, so let's talk a little bit about graphing translations with this squared reciprocal function. Okay, we have a lot going on in this example I'm giving you. All right, so let's talk about what each piece is doing. Okay. For starters, I have a minus 2 right here next to the x. So we know that that is a horizontal translation. We will be going to the right two units. All right, we have a minus 3 out here on the end. What's that doing? 
it's sending our function down three units. And notice we also have this minus out in front. And what does the minus do to a function when it's out in front like that? Exactly. It is going to flip or reflect our function over the y-axis, over the x-axis. So I'm going to just say over x. All right. So we're re flipping over the x-axis. We're shifting to the right two, and we're shifting down three. Am I going to try to do the, all of this point by point? Absolutely not. Notice that I'm just shifting my asymptotes. Okay. My asymptotes were both axes. All right, and since I'm going to the right two, my vertical asymptote is shifting to the right two. And similarly, my horizontal asymptote was the x-axis, but now I'm shifting it what should be down three. I'm a little off there, but I'm sure you can get the gist here. I am shifting my axis down three, all right, or my horizontal asymptote rather. And then the negative flips it over the x-axis. So without the negative, out in front, we would see our function up here because it's originally in the first and second quadrant. But because we're flipping over um, the x-axis, really what it's going to look like to you guys is that you're flipping over that horizontal asymptote. Okay? All right, and again, just note the asymptotes are what moved right two and down three. And from there, you will graph your function. Right again, how does this change our domain and range? Well, since we went to the right two, now we cannot plug in two, or now x cannot equal two, as we see in the domain here. All right, similarly, before our range was zero to infinity. All right, but now we shifted down three and we flipped the darn thing over that horizontal asymptote. And so we can see logically how this is changing our range. All right, it would be negative three to infinity had we not flipped it. But since we flipped it, the range becomes negative infinity to negative three.